Okay, okay. <laughs> Hello world and welcome back to Some Kind of Gaming. So we've pretty much been gamers for our entire lives. We have had to take some time off here and there, but for the most part, video games have played a huge role in who we are today. We've seen many trends come and go, from LAN parties to Red Rings of Death, but none hold quite a special place in our hearts as the golden age of 3D platforming. The late 90s and early 2000s was a time of innovation. PlayStation and Xbox had just started to make their mark on the industry, and the idea of roaming around a fully 3D world was still new. What a time to be alive. It truly was such a special time in video game history. I don't know about you guys, but nostalgia is one of my favourite things. So when a game is able to draw me back into those golden years of my childhood, I am all for it. One of those genre-defining moments was Super Mario 64. Like Super Mario Bros. before, this game helped pioneer a whole new genre of video games, the 3D platformer. Among the best titles on any modern Nintendo system is, of course, a mainline 3D Mario game. Unfortunately though, this means that a plethora of fantastic titles end up living in the shadow of Super Mario. So if you have ever enjoyed a platforming experience with everyone's favourite red overall plumber, then keep watching till the end of the video. You might find your next favourite game. Don't forget to hit that like button, and if you're new here to some kind of gaming, please consider subscribing. But without further ado, let's get into today's video. The best 3D platformers on Switch that aren't Mario. That intro was unintentionally the perfect segue to our first game, A Hat in Time. This little indie gem just lives and breathes in the retro nostalgia, taking heavy inspiration from Nintendo 64 classics such as Mario 64 and Banjo-Kazooie. Originally released for PC in 2017, this game almost didn't find its way to a Nintendo system. Thankfully though, due to a push from fans, it made its way to the Switch in late 2019. And we're so happy that it did. A Hat in Time just seems perfectly at home on a Nintendo console. And the fact that you can take this bad boy anywhere you want is just the cherry on top of the pudding. You play as an alien named Hat Kid, who looks strikingly similar to a young girl in a top hat. The story begins when her spaceship is attacked by the Mafia of a planet she's passing over. Unfortunately, this causes Hat Kid, as well as her ship's fuel source, the Time Pieces, to come crashing down to the surface below. It's Hat Kid's mission to collect enough Time Pieces to power her ship back up again. It's a classic I just want to go home type storyline. Along the way she'll meet a variety of characters like a overly flamboyant penguin and a girl with a moustache, aptly named Moustache Girl. <laughs> There's no need to overcomplicate the names. A Hat in Time sees you exploring a wide variety of open levels. In a similar style to Mario 64 where you have to jump in and out for each mission. Every now and then these open levels will be abandoned in favour of a more linear style design. Honestly, this just keeps gameplay fresh and interesting, giving the player many different missions to look forward to. The game is a self-confessed collectathon, with many items for you to discover, including, but not limited, to pawns, the in-game currency that allows you to buy ability-increasing badges, relics used to unlock bonus levels, and my personal favourite, yarn balls. <laughs> yarn balls are probably a hat in time's most unique mechanic. With these, you're able to craft new hats for Hat Kid to wear. And in turn, these grant you new abilities. There's a visor, which allows for a faster sprint, and a witch's hat, which allows you to lob explosives at enemies. These hats are often necessary to complete levels and occasionally allow access to previously inaccessible areas. Hat Kid's weapon of choice is an umbrella. And while the combat is simple, some of the boss fights can be really challenging and rewarding. The platforming really takes precedence here and is honestly really solid. Controls are far easier and natural than I remember any 64 game being, but maybe we just grew up. Ultimately, A Hat in Time is an adorable family-friendly adventure with an extremely quirky story and an adorable art style. Perfect for retro fans and newcomers alike. We highly recommend picking this one up for your Nintendo Switch. Many 3D platformers of today rely heavily on the nostalgia of yesterday. Anthropomorphic animals, cartoon style graphics and family friendly themes are all common within the genre, so it's really nice when a title tries to break away from that. Pumpkin Jack puts a dark spin on the otherwise light hearted experience of jumping over platforms. In this game, the devil himself has taken over, and in response, the people have nominated a champion, a wizard with the power to combat evil. I bet you thought that we were going to say that you play as this wizard, but no. Pumpkin Jack sees you playing for the dark side. The devil picks his own champion, the Pumpkin Lord Jack, 
to help crush the people and spread his darkness to all corners of the planet. As Jack, you'll run, slash, and of course jump your way through a variety of spooky, Halloween-inspired levels. You'll also meet some of the Devil's Advocates, including a mysterious man who's there to sell you skins, and a talking crow who ends up becoming your long-ranged weapon. The platforming here is extremely enjoyable, albeit a little harder than some of the other games on this list. I think that this lends itself to the more mature themes in this game. Some of the platforms are a bit smaller and Jack controls a little floaty in the air, which isn't a bad thing, it just makes it slightly more difficult and takes a wee bit of getting used to. The combat is also far more in depth than any other game on this list. Timing and dodging play an important role in taking down enemies. What seems like a simple hack and slash on the surface is actually far more in depth as you tackle hordes of the undead and some surprisingly challenging bosses, unlocking a variety of weapons along the way. Every now and then, Jack ditches his meatless body in favour of being a disembodied head. This creates a refreshing change in gameplay as you set about solving some puzzles and burning down some bars. Apparently pumpkins are quite flammable. Pumpkin Jack is a very linear title with no hub world to speak of. It's just a straight progression through to the end of each level. You are able to explore a little bit and search for some hidden crow heads, the only collectible in the game. With Halloween just around the corner, it seems like the perfect time to pick up this game. It really leans into the spooky vibes with all of the purples and green present in the art style. Here's a game that really stays true to the 3D platforming classics, but does just enough to put itself into a league of its own. A breath of fresh air, if you will. Next up, we'll jump into something far more traditional, complete with anthropomorphic animals and those beautiful cartoon graphics reminiscent of your favourite 90s classics. We're of course talking about this bad boy, New Super Lucky's Tale. It was actually a pretty long road to get to this one. If you have an Xbox One, you might be familiar with Super Lucky's Tale, which was released in 2017. But today we're talking about New Super Lucky's Tale, which is a totally revamped partial remake released on the Switch in 2019. Now, we are unable to comment on the original, but according to sources, it didn't receive the greatest of reviews, being criticised for its terrible controls and poor camera. We can, however, confirm that absolutely none of those issues are present on this one. So if you did find the original a little bit underwhelming, it's definitely worth checking out again. How often does a developer listen to criticism, go back to the drawing board and release a totally revamped version of their game? Playful Studios deserves at least some credit for that. You play as Lucky Swifttail, a guardian of the Book of Ages, who has called on you to protect it from the evil sorcerer Jinx and his ferocious family of felines, the kitty litter. As Lucky, you'll travel through the book and collect its scattered pages, in the process defeating the crafty yet extremely talented Children of Jinx. New Super Lucky's Tale contains a variety of hub worlds which act as a link to its variety of levels. Each hub world contains its own unique inhabitants and is plagued by one member of the litter. It's Lucky's job to find enough pages so that he can defeat this member in a boss fight and move on to the next hub. This variety means that the game never gets old. As well as the classic 3D action, there are a number of auto-run 2D challenges. There are also a variety of pages to collect within each level, meaning that there's far more to do than simply get to the end. You'll often have to help the locals, collect coins, find hidden clothes, and collect the lucky letters. New Super Lucky's Tale plays heavily into Lucky's digging ability, a unique mechanic which helps separate this title from its contemporaries. Lucky is able to travel underground on almost every surface. This gives him a speed boost which comes in super handy during the auto run levels and also leads to some pretty interesting boss fights where dodging is only possible while he's underground. Here though the speed boost is a bit of a hindrance because Lucky becomes hard to control. This game is definitely a short and sweet experience. If you're just looking to gun it to the end, then that's definitely doable in a single sitting. But we recommend taking your time with it. Enjoy searching for all the pages and completing all of the puzzles. New Super Lucky's Tale is an amazingly fun adventure which is suitable for all ages and experience levels. Definitely don't sleep on this cute little title. We honestly never thought a time would come where we'd be able to create a list of games for a Nintendo console and talk about some of the greatest PlayStation exclusives of all time. I grew up on Spyro the Dragon. Me and my brother played all three of these games to death in childhood. My favourite experience though was when I was 16 and I got my lip pierced. My mum literally couldn't look at me so I wasn't allowed to leave my room for the whole weekend. 
My brother snuck in the PlayStation and we basically did a Spyro marathon for two days straight. So having these games remastered with such an update on graphics on my favourite console was basically a dream come true for me. I think that any one of these games could go into the running for greatest 3D platformer. So having them all in one place in the form of the Spyro Reignited trilogy really cements this as a must buy for whatever system you own. Now it has been quite a while since Spyro the Dragon released exclusively for the PS1, so it's no surprise that the game does feel a little dated by today's standards. Having the quality of life improvements that the trilogy brings with it not only attracts longtime fans like ourselves, but also introduces a whole new generation to the beauty that is Spyro the Dragon. All three games play pretty similarly. You start off in a hub world which is basically a level in itself with its own gems and collectibles, and depending on the game you'll either have to free the dragons or collect talismans in order to proceed to the next overworld. The standard platforming levels are brilliantly designed, being mostly non-linear and tailored perfectly to suit Spyro's abilities. These include a charge attack, which is perfect for shattering stone and metal, as well as the obvious fire breathing, which should come equipped to any good dragon. Both of these abilities make combat super rewarding and will often have to be interchanged in order to take down larger foes. As well as the platforming, each game features a number of flying levels, where Spyro will soar around trying to complete a number of tricks including flying through rings and destroying objects. It seems that most games in this genre have at least some sort of unique stages that are separate from your running and jumping, and these flying levels are among some of the most well executed and most fun. Spyro 2, Ripto's Rage, introduces us to some far more fleshed out NPCs, with many actually returning for appearances in the third title. Hunter is this frisky cheater who slowly becomes Spyro's best bud, and Moneybags is this money hungry banker who's constantly charging Spyro for his own work. Both of these characters are instant classics, and their updated sprites really bring a level of emotion that just wasn't quite there in 1999. The Reignited Trilogy comes with over 40 hours of gameplay. You might be thinking that by Spyro 3 Year of the Dragon you'd be a little sick of Spyro's moveset and the somewhat similar level design, but this isn't an issue as the third game in the series introduces new playable characters and new challenges for Spyro. We won't give too much away, but the first friend you encounter is Sheila the Kangaroo, who I feel a special connection with, being Australian and all. She comes with both a double jump and a ground pound move. These are both exclusive to her. Also, there's the introduction of some skateboard levels for Spyro, which are amongst the most memorable of the entire franchise. Spyro the Dragon was one of the original platforming mascots for the PlayStation, and these games still hold true today. Being able to play them on the Switch is such a treat, and they feel perfectly at home on the hybrid console. Now, it's funny that you mentioned PlayStation mascots, because back in the day, right beside Spyro, you had Crash Bandicoot. Now this franchise also had an extremely well received remaster of its first three classic games, the Insane Trilogy. However, we limited ourselves to but a single Crash title here, and while the trilogy has a ton of content, there has since been a brand new Crash Bandicoot game for us to enjoy. Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time is the retcon fourth entry in the Crash series. Basically the Insane Trilogy did so well that the developers just decided to pick up where that one left off and ignore all the other games in the series. This makes perfect logistical and economic sense and leads to some pretty funny dialogue as Crash and his sister Coco try and explain it away in game. It's about time once again revolves around Dr. Neocortex trying to take over the world, but this time he has found a way to rip holes in space time and instead plans to take over every world in the entire multiverse. This premise allows for the return of all your favourite villains as Cortex travels the cosmos in search for his ragtag team of baddies. Personally, I was most excited for Engine to appear, but no matter who your favourite Doctor N was, chances are they'll make an appearance. Now we won't talk too much about it because, spoilers, but the story is surprisingly in-depth for a Crash game and for a 3D platformer in general. The writing is fantastic as we often found ourselves laughing out loud to the wacky and surprisingly intelligent humour. They've done a really good job to get you emotionally invested in the otherwise silent protagonist, Crash. This game allows you to play as both Crash and Coco from the get-go, but along the way you'll meet many other allies who you're also able to play as. This is why we're talking about this game and not the remaster trilogy. Dingo Dial! Oh man, I loved this guy growing up and I was so excited to be able to play as him in a mainline Crash game. 
His suck cannon is such a breath of fresh swamp air from the Bandicoot's classic run, jump, spin playstyle. There are a number of other characters you're able to play as, but I think spoiling one is probably enough for now. Just know that these allies are really fun to control and help dramatically to change up the gameplay. Like most Crash games, this isn't exactly easy. <laughs> so just when you feel frustrated enough to throw your controller across the room, a new level style will pop up, making it far less likely that you'll destroy your hardware. The game's hard, but it's not unfair. The level design here is fantastic, with each new world being drastically different from the last. The developers have also done a really good job adding variety to the series' already established mechanics. Each level is pretty short and sharp, which is a great way to offset that difficulty, but also means that they're jam-packed full of puzzles, platforms and new ideas. Every now and then you'll notice that Crash and Coco switch to a 2.5D style of gameplay, and you won't miss your old favourites, like riding the polar bear or running towards the camera away from giant enemies. <laughs> Crash 4 seems to have an endless amount of content, with each level having 12 gems for you to collect by completing various tasks. These include gathering enough Wumpa fruit, finding a hidden gem, and completing each level without dying more than three times. This makes for a huge amount of replay value, as we haven't even mentioned bonus areas, time trials, and each level having an inverted mode. It's about time has been fully optimised for the Nintendo Switch with what seems like a complete graphical overhaul. So even though it's a less powerful system, it'll still play just as well as it will anywhere else. Crash is the most difficult platformer on our list, so if you're looking for a challenge, look no further. So there you have it everyone, 5 games to check out on the Switch if you love Mario. We tried our best to include a good amount of indie games as well as old favourites, but obviously there's some we've missed. If we have missed your favourite platformer or you have any other suggestions, please let us know in the comments below. 3D platformers are some of my favourite games and I'd honestly love to try any other titles you can think of. Thank you so much for making it to the end of another video. You guys are honestly the best and your support is so much appreciated. Maybe you could share this video with a friend who has fond memories of the golden age of platforming or who just really loves Mario. So until next time my friends, you've been watching Some Kind of Gaming.